elbow is a synovial joint, more specifically a hinge joint. It consists of two articulations, the trochlear notch of the ulna and the trochlea of the humerus, and secondly, the head of the radius and the capitulum of the humerus. Another articulation to also keep in mind is the one that exists between the proximal radius and the ulna, the radio ulna joint. Stabilization of the joint is mostly offered by the capsule enclosing the joint. There are collateral ligaments both medially and laterally. The medial collateral ligament, also known as the ulnar collateral ligament, and the lateral collateral ligament, also known as the radial collateral ligament. The radial collateral ligament blends in with the ligament that lies proximal to the radio ulnar joint, the annular ligament. Another important structure in the elbow is the bursa. We will not cover them in this video. The elbow joint is marked by the medial and lateral epicondyles as well as the lecronon. The normal range of motion of the elbow in extension and flexion is 0 to 150 degrees. When the elbow is extended, the forearm normally lies in slight valgus. The average pediatric carrying angle is 15 degrees. Now that we've covered some basic anatomy, let's have a look at the types of elbow fractures. Distal humerus fractures are common and classified according to their location in respect to the condyles. Supracondylar fractures are the most common type and will be the focus in this video. Supracondylar fractures. This is a common fracture of childhood and is relatively rare in adults. This fracture is mostly a fracture of childhood because of the weak point that exists in the elbow as a result of multiple factors. These factors include the cartilaginous nature of the distal humerus, the larger lecheron and coronoid fossa, and the stronger ligaments than bones. Injury is usually due to hyperextension, which occurs when one falls an outstretched arm. During hyperextension, two things happen. There is a supracondylar fracture and a hemarthrosis that forms. This displaces the fat pads. The anterior fat pad displaces superiorly and the posterior fat pad displaces posteriorly. When looking at the x-ray, in most cases you'll find posterior displacement and tilt. This is important to note as it can result in neurovascular complications as the proximal fracture segment can poke the soft tissue causing injury to the breaker artery and median nerve. Damage to the anterior interosseous nerve is detected by the inability to do the OK sign. Always examine the patient using the look, feel, move outline. A child with posterior displacement presents with a painful, swollen elbow and it can sometimes be deformed. You should feel for neurovascular fallout. Check the pulses and exclude compartment syndrome and check the median nerve for both sensory and motor function. Inability to do the OK sign should alert one to possible injury to the anterior interosseous nerve. You may see swelling and bruising and find that the patient is unable to move the elbow joint. Always exclude a compartment syndrome. Always request an AP and lateral x-rays. Look for a fat pad sign. Normal lateral views show a fat pad anteriorly. The posterior fat pad is usually not visible. It is hidden behind the intercondylar fossa. Notice in this x-ray that the anterior fat pad is elevated. The posterior fat pad is visible. The presence of a posterior fat pad on x-ray is pathognomonic. If you find no fracture line, you must still treat it as a fracture and is likely to be an occult fracture. However, this is not true when there's displacement of the anterior fat pad, as the displacement of this fat pad may be due to an effusion. Subtle fractures are very easy to miss. Checking for alignment is helpful in determining a fracture. All you need to remember is the anterior humeral line. The anterior humeral line is the line seen on the lateral view and goes along the anterior surface of the humerus. It should pass through the middle third of the capitulum. In cases of a supracondylar fracture, the anterior humeral line usually passes through the anterior third of the capitulum or in front of the capitulum. The Bowman's angle should also be calculated. Once you've had a look at the x-ray, it's important to classify the fracture according to the Gartner classification. This will determine whether conservative or surgical management is undertaken. 